Hey golfers, and welcome back to another episode of Second Swing Thoughts, the uh, our Second Swing brand podcast. And today we have a very special guest. It is Bella McCauley. Uh, so if you've been following the YouTube channel, uh, we've had Bella on the YouTube channel several times. And um, this is our first time on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So uh, Bella, first of all, thank you for stopping by today and spending some time with us. Um, it's been, obviously it's been awesome to have you on the YouTube channel, but also as we get into a little bit as well, it's been cool to follow your kind of career, your golf career starting, and I know you've been getting fit at Second Swing for a long time. Now you're playing for the Gophers, so uh, it's been really fun to watch. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited because, like you said, we've done some videos about yeah. with our swing and different um, club testing stuff, and so it'll be fun. We haven't had a chance to really sit down and talk about golf or just how things are at the U, so um, I hope to like encourage some young golfers today, people who maybe aspire to go into collegiate um, level sports and um, yeah, it'll be a fun conversation. Yeah, I know we were talking, uh, I think last time we filmed, we t- had a discussion sort of off air about the, the balance that you have to find yeah. between, you know, the, the practice obviously it takes to play at a high level for golf, but also like your yeah. studies and, and maintaining all of that. And then when I mean, you guys are in the season, you're kind of just nonstop going. Um, it, the, the D1 golf schedule and sort of lifestyle is a, is a different animal during season because you guys are pretty much always traveling. You might get a couple days back home and then you're flying out somewhere else again. Uh, that's That would be a big adjustment for me personally. I, I imagine for you it was too. Yeah, it was, it was really much, uh, a huge adjustment, especially um, I didn't travel a ton in my high school career. A lot of, I played in a couple national events um, here and there, but most of it was, was local. And so, and so like it was a huge transition into like traveling so much especially in the spring um i think my teammate and i counted recently and last spring we were like on 30 35 flights in just like a couple months and so yeah it gets to be really crazy especially in the heat of it when you have school and you have um you're just trying to balance life and really like once you get home you're trying to unpack it like do some laundry get ready for the next tournament because you're leaving the next day so it's kind of crazy and i think um i didn't realize that going into it this year i'll be a little bit more prepared entering the spring yeah yeah so you you hinted that a little bit but your uh your high school career was also phenomenal and and i think you know quickly i think well in talking with like your fitter aaron roth too i think it was it was pretty apparent that you had a ton of golf game um, early on and so can you kind of describe the you know maybe even give a little bit of the background of your high school career and then also I kind of am curious about how you made about you made what about the decision to choose the University of Minnesota for your college yeah for sure so I started golf when I was six years old my dad got me into golf he used to teach a really long time ago and doesn't anymore but got my sister into it at a very young age and we really clicked with it like immediately um me more so than her she kind of did a little bit later on but when I was 10 or when I was 8 I did my first tournament and I'm a really competitive person so that um, kind of fueled it even more and then I would say I actually started getting even more serious at like age 10 which is where I think um, I went to start I went and started going to Aaron Roth at second swing mm-hmm. to get fit and I think that honestly leveled up my game to it brought my game to another level just because I was able to use clubs that were like women's clubs or catered to exactly my swing speed my swing type um, rather than just some U.S. kids clubs like I had been using so that was a huge transition for me as I got more serious Uh, my parents started realizing that this was something that I was probably going to do for a really long time and so um, they made a little bit more of an investment there and then it just kind of continued. Um, I just loved playing and I still do. And so I I love just spending hours at the golf course, like all summer, I pretty much live out there. (laughs) I love the range actually more than some, most people I would say. Oh yeah. Um, All, most a typical like summer for me um, is like five days a week. I'll be out there for like seven hours, a four hour round and three hour practice. And then the other day, I'll do a six or five hour or five hour practice. Um, no, nope, I wouldn't play on the golf course and then one day off. So that's like a typical week for wow. me. Yeah, it gets, it's, it's like really fun, but I, I just love it. Like it's just because I love playing golf and I love yeah. being out there. I love the atmosphere. I just love everyone at, at Southview where I play. And so I think just the love of the game, like really, um, 
like encourage me to just keep going even though it was like a really <laughs> like a lot of golf like it's yeah. like every day all day but I just really loved it and then um and I had the opportunity, I, I think I realized it probably like in eighth, ninth grade that I was gonna have some good opportunities for college. Um, women's golf is actually one of the couple of sports that actually is a really good opportunity for scholarship no matter like what level you're at. Um, because of Title IX, women's golf, women's, so women's softball, mm -hmm, and I think there's sure. one other that have like a lot of scholarship money. And so at a young age, I kind of knew, I think I would have potential for that. Um, Minnesota, I actually got offered at, a, at like in eighth grade before really? the dead period started and I didn't take it. I waited like until right after my junior year when I started talking to a bunch of schools. Um, I was planning on going far away just to play in warmer weather and um, get out of the cold, but COVID hit as everyone knows. And so that changed a lot for scholarship things. and. Um, and at, at the end of the day, I had some other scholarship offers, but chose Minnesota, and I couldn't be more happy. Like, I am so happy I chose Minnesota. Really? Yeah. Like, yeah, no regrets at all. Um, it's funny because people in the recruiting process tend to think like, oh, you know, I said no to some school in California. Like, I'll never see them again. You actually really like do continue to see them in your college career because you're playing with them in tournaments. Right, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's kind of funny because then you know I still run into some of those coaches today and they're they're super great and encouraging, but um, super happy with Minnesota and I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, that's it. It sounds like you just have a an otherworldly love for for golf. And yeah, that's kind of what has driven you this whole time from a young age. I mean, you the the, yeah. the number of hours you said that you spend at a golf course. I mean, it, it's I was trying to do the math in my head of like working a job. 40 hours a week and I'm pretty sure you surpassed that or pretty darn close yeah. to in terms of like hours spent at the golf course. So you know, basically for you from a young age, you almost made golf like a, a full time commitment where yeah. you're spending as much time as you can out there. And because of that, I know there's the rule of like 10,000 hours, you know, that's when you become <laughs> yeah. an expert at something. Uh, I'm, I would imagine through the years you've really you've you've you made sure to hit that hours mark and that's how you become yeah. so good and so talented. And so, um, you know, now you're accomplishing a ton even into your college career. Yeah, no, thank you. I think um, there's definitely times where, you know, it's bad weather or it's it just gets to be a really long day and you don't want to yeah. keep staying out there. And I, I did at a young age, I like just push myself to be out there for as long as possible because I knew when um, push came to shove at tournaments, like I'd have more of an edge on competitors. And um, most of the time I just I just love being out there as well, I think we have a really good atmosphere at Southview and so I'd play with um, members young and old, got to know everyone. Um, and then as Reese got into it, my sister, we started playing a lot together and so that's been really fun as well. Right. So yeah, kind of a bit of both of like really loving it but also like pushing myself to go even further. Mm -hmm. um, and when you made the adjustment to, cause, cause the other part of that too is in the in the winter months around here, growing yeah. up in Minnesota, you obviously like how. What well, I guess that's a good question. Like how how did you manage to spend get your golf time in in the yeah. winter months at growing up and even now still? How, how do you get your golf swings in during the the months where you can't go outside? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it all comes down to perspective. Honestly, at a young age, I like basically told myself I'm going to look at this as a as a positive, <clears throat> and I'm going to spend fall and winter months when we can't be outside and I'm gonna work on my golf swing and do all the mechanics, not worry about where I'm hitting it, just spend a lot of time working on the golf swing. And I think I, I really also made it a priority to not take a ton of time off either. I would take a week off here and there for the holidays, I still do, but for the most part, um, even just an hour to, typically about two, three hours a day, um, just to like keep up my skills and um, work on my swing so that I know when like spring comes I'll have those changes in place it's really hard to work on your swing while trying to play well right um, my dad always says separate mechanics from results and so I really try to do that and focus on the technical side in the right. winter months how would so is that even like just hitting shots into a net or even like something like <clears throat> you know obviously you're limited in Minnesota hitting indoor you have to find a space you yep. got to find places there's, there's places that have you know, simulators, there's places that have, you know, indoor facilities, but there's like, it, it, 
it is tough because there's so many golfers yeah. in Minnesota too that are looking for an answer to do this. And then I'm one of those people that I just yeah. kind of like, I golf, golf in quotes, you know, once or twice a month in the yeah. winter months because there's limited options and it's obviously you can't go outside on the golf course. Yeah, it's really hard. I would say, so growing up before college, we have a net in our basement. I spent a good amount of time down there a couple of days a week. My dad also made, was super kind. He like was always made it a priority to take my sister and I to the golf dome before we could drive, which oh, sure. was really nice. Yeah. So we would go there a couple times a week as well, just to get outside of the house and like be able to practice out, out, um, outside yeah. of just like a net and be able to see the golf ball at least like 60 yards or so. Right, right. And so that was what I did growing up. Now I actually, we're super blessed with our facilities at the U. It's mm -hmm. incredible. So we're on the back of, of Les Bolstad in the indoor facility there. And there's about six indoor heated bays that open up. Um, we have track man, GC quad, indoor putting green. I actually, even during holiday months when I'm home, I, I still drive up there because there's it the there's no facility that compares to right, it for yeah. sure anywhere close so um but i still sometimes go to the dome still sometimes yeah. hit downstairs at home so um i think it's all about just like perspective and, and staying consistent even if it's just an hour a day yeah you know it's it's it really is hard to be motivated and i think everyone's in that boat but the more you can just keep up with the skills the easier it's going to be once spring starts and you're not going to be regretting Right. regretting the winter months oh yeah because i even remember because so for my experience of high school golf in south dakota the boys golf yeah. was in the fall okay. which was really nice because yep. then i had all those months um you know leading up to the fall season where i was practice i was my game was in yeah. quote unquote form um but i even you know i've talked to some friends of mine i met in college i played high school golf in minnesota and obviously that's in the spring and so trying to you know rekindle the golf swing over you know, right away in March, April, and, yeah. and then obviously in addition to that, you have snow cancellations every year. Um, I I can't imagine now for someone that's maybe in the high school level now um, trying to maintain their golf swing through the winter without the kind of practice that you're mentioning here is just staying consistent at it and making sure the swing is still there. And then all of a sudden the competition comes in the spring and you're ready. Yeah, I think all high school golfers face it. Um... Minnesota's a little unique. Like you said, South Dakota and Wisconsin actually have their golf season in the fall. Mm -hmm. We have it in the spring. And so it, it is interesting because you can kind of see the separation a bit more from the, from the golfers that take it really seriously and those who don't because they're not practicing at all. Either mm -hmm. You're either practicing the winter or you're not. And so the ones, it, the, the gap is definitely more significant, I think. Um, just having a season in the spring because it, it it for sure like points out those that aren't practicing right, yeah. versus those who are. And I think it also motivates you to stay ready for the once the spring comes because right. you don't have the time. Once it's here, once the snow melts, it's go time. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, so I think my sister actually has that coming up this following year. And so she's um, she's working hard all winter just to, just to stay ready. Yeah, well, clearly she learned kind of the, the best practices there from, <laughs> from her older sister. So, um, Wanted to ask about your first college win. Yeah. We had to, we had to talk about that. So yeah. uh, this past fall, um, for those who don't know, Bella won the Boilermaker Invitational. Is that the correct name yeah. of the event? Okay, the Boilermaker Invitational. So Purdue was hosting. Um, I think you won by like three shots. Yeah. Uh, three days in the 60s. So first of all, like, did you feel going into the event like... Oh, I might. I, I'm feeling really good. Like I might go ahead and win this thing. Or I mean, how does I want to know to what it feels like mentally to play golf at that level. Okay, yeah. So actually, what's interesting, I would say I'm, I'm just like really hard on myself in terms of golf. Like, like I don't probably see myself the way other people might view my golf game, even if we're playing together. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I just tend to see it differently. Um, which has its like pros and cons, and definitely working on that. But I would say I, I wasn't exactly like playing particularly amazing leading up to it. And then, but I spent like two weeks beforehand really like leaving um, mechanics behind and just focusing on playing golf and getting the ball in the hole. And so actually that weekend, we literally got on campus the like Friday, September 1st. And we had qualifying that day. I moved in that day and we left the next morning at six in the morning for our first tournament. So we literally had no time whatsoever to like, 
we're like we had like two rounds of qualifying mm -hmm. we had like no time to be ready on campus it was like just go time yep. and so I actually felt like I played pretty good in qualifying rounds um, the rounds were okay nothing special but I felt like I left stuff out there but I was like ah, the game feels like in decent shape you know what but certainly was not expecting anything that the Boilermaker produced um, I played really well and I think it was just one of the things that I really try to focus on going in at tournaments um, is just like the mental side of things. Yeah. And that's what I think I did really well there was I pretty much didn't know what I was at the whole time. Um, the, what some people don't know is actually the first round. So we had we went 36 holes and then 18 holes. And okay. on the 36 hole day, I actually shanked a shot. So I wow. shot. Yeah, I know. So I was. I was actually nine under for the first, like that 36 holes. Okay, that's and pretty good. And you yeah, had a shank. Yeah, and I had a <laughs> shank. And so, like, when I sh when I shanked, I think I was on like I don't know the 22nd hole or something, and I was like, well, like we have so many holes, it doesn't, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't yeah. really matter. But I easily could have been like, oh shoot, a shank. Like, what am I gonna do the next shot? Like. I made a double there, but I really just like looked at it like, okay, like next hole, time to move on. Like you just, that's like one of the things about competitive golf is you really just have to like let the misses like come because they're going to come. You've got so many shots. Golf is a game of misses. And as long as you can minimize them and kind of move on from that, that's, you're really set. So I think that's what I did well at that tournament was just really let things go. I didn't um, really know what I was at the whole time. I was just playing golf, trying to enjoy it, enjoy the nice weather, enjoy the people I was yeah. playing with. And um, but yeah, kind of crazy. I really, I really did hit a shank and like <laughs> then chunked it out of the bunker and like somehow made double, made an up and down for double actually. It's like an up and down. I mean, that's a good <laughs> double, all I was, things like, considered. I might have fist pumped. I was pretty pumped about it. <laughs> so like, you were, I mean, nine under after thirty six. You had to be at or near the lead at that point, right? Yeah. So, so then going into the final 18, were you thinking, like, I have to wonder about that because, I mean, I, I'm sure at some level in your mind, you're like, oh, my gosh, like, I, I, yeah. I, could, I could win a college tournament. But you're, yeah. I'm sure you're trying to suppress that, that thought, too, and just yeah. try to stay kind of focused on this next shot, this tee shot, this, this approach shot. Let's make this putt and, and yeah. try to ignore that noise. I would say that's like one of the hardest things about golf in general is you just have so much time to think about it. You have time between rounds. You have time to warm up. I mean, it's just a full day process. Like, you know, in a hockey game or a basketball match, whatever it is, like it's going to go so fast. You're running. You're not paying attention to the time. Like with golf, there's so much time in between, so much waiting. You really have to like either distract yourself yeah. or be like completely content with where you're at. And so between rounds, I like knew I was leading, but I really was at a point of like, I don't know what I'm at. I'm just going to go out and try to play good golf. And um, which considering the fact that like I, I, that was a pretty good mentality for me to be at, considering winning a collegiate tournament was like one of my main goals in college. Mm -hmm. And so to see myself at that leaderboard, I actually had been in previous times at similar spots like that throughout my freshman year. And um didn't come through on the last on the last round and so I think that also probably mentally prepared me mm -hmm. a little bit as well but I really just entered it like I'm gonna go try to play my best put down a good round I know if I can shoot another round like 69 70 or whatever I'll probably win but I need to just focus on my on my own game yeah and having a good time because then it will come otherwise mm -hmm. I'm gonna lose control <laughs> yeah right right well so that I mean <clears throat> clearly that Playing well like that, it, it can kind of make the, the maybe the stresses of the balance that we initially we, we hinted at before the balance. And I kind of wanted to ask more about that too, because you, when you're winning tournaments, it can make the balance of trying to deal with schoolwork and golf and all the time that golf requires, and obviously with studying and and uh, trying to balance all that. You've mentioned to me before, like how when you're traveling, like you're trying to find any time you can to get some studying in. So uh, yeah. like, can mm -hmm. you, can you go over that again? Like, like, cause you mentioned before, like even like waiting in line for security at the airport, you'll whip yeah. out a book and, and look at like, is that really, I mean, yeah, it, that's it, crazy. It is really crazy. So <laughs> like last spring, I, I mean, I really would, like I would do school in the security line of the airport, waiting to get on the plane. I do school on the plane. I do school in the Uber on the way to the hotel. I do school after my rounds. 
and then the whole situation on the way back as well like on the way back to the airport on the plane like you really just do school whenever you get the chance i think the other thing too that's important for those who are maybe thinking about being college athletes is like being a really good time manager and so for me i always am looking ahead at like the next week of school and being like okay when are my really big assignments and do i need to get ahead of them because of a tournament because i don't the last thing i want is to be getting ready for the final day and i have this like six page paper due like i need to be have that ready i need to at least have getting started on that so i think it's just always looking ahead and time managing but it really is crazy like our first three weeks this this fall we were home maybe two days yeah and so you're never in class you're never in your in-person classes you're um, constantly emailing professors to keep you updated on what's happening and you're just like always trying to stay up ahead of, of assignments and then and that's the other thing in the spring is like you really can't push things either you can't ask for extensions or you could but it would be pretty difficult because the, the season's so long and it just keeps going so you really just have to stay ahead of things to minimize stress as much as possible I think um, prioritizing is really important as well like school golf and then anything else, you know, can come after. But, like, you really do have to prioritize, like, what's in front of you. Because it can get really tough if you're yeah. trying oh. to manage everything. But it, it, it really is crazy. And I don't think I expected that. I mean, my parents, like, like know me just, like, calling and be like, I like, this is just so much. Like, I like it just gets to be really a lot. Oh, yeah. But. I mean, and again, I, I have a, a, a fraction of that perspective as a former Division three college golfer <laughs> for two years of yeah. my college experience. No, there it's was, for, it's, you know, it's there was, true. It, there was, you know, yeah. I and mean, then in the fall season, we'd go out to the course for probably three, four hours. Yeah. Um, and you know, we suddenly, you know, I mean, this is my experience, but like, let's say you get a class till like two o'clock or three o'clock, go out there, you're back at your dorm room probably eight o'clock, eat food, and all of a sudden, it's if you're exhausted from the day, you have a, an hour maybe for for homework. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, at that level now, at the Division One level, and you're traveling way more, um, and you're flying places instead of me just driving two hours um, <laughs> for a tournament. So that's uh, no, that's I, a real I, thing I, though too. I respect uh, the heck out of that, uh, being able to manage that. And so, I guess for the spring, how quickly does that fire up for you guys for the spring season? Because now yeah. we're we're you know we're recording this right before the holidays. Um, and now this, the so the spring season will start. Is it like right away in January you have tournaments, or how long is that wait? Yeah, so our first tournaments the first week of February. We okay. will do two weekend training trips in January. Like once we get back to school the next weekend, we go on two training trips, um, and those won't interfere with school at all. But it's once the tournaments come. Actually, February is not too bad as well. We only have two events in February. Starting March, it really picks up though. March, April gets okay. to be a lot. Um, we you're just constantly going right. you're like never home in, the, in that time period and it's also just like just like managing even being in contact with like your academic advisor and being like okay like I need to make sure my load's a little bit lighter at this portion of the year and I can take a on a little bit more in the fall like you really just have to be like thinking ahead and like planning that out so that when that time comes you're not stressed and you're not like freaking out because you easily could be yeah um I would say May when like postseason is is actually not too bad just because like school has ended at that time right and we're, yeah you know we only have golf to that's over on. like in May right is when you guys yeah. are kind of doing your quote-unquote postseason yeah. golf so yeah. we get done in like maybe May 5th to 10th right, for, yeah. with school and postseason might be like the 20th or whatever okay. so yeah so we've got that's like, nice at least in the postseason really golf nice. you're not uh, if you know if someone in the back of their mind is thinking, oh my gosh, you got this big final, like yeah. you don't have to worry about any of that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely huge. I think, but yeah, it's it's crazy. You just really have to manage it and um, and and kind of also accept the fact that like it, it your schedule is just going to be different than any of your other friends at school. Right. Like they just like it just is, and that's a fact. And um, you know when they might be going out, hanging out with friends or whatever, you really do just have to be at practice or studying or working out or yeah. like. Yeah, takes probably some yeah. crazy discipline to. Yeah. Uh, stay on top of that, but uh, again, kudos to you for clearly you're able to pull that off. So. No, thank um, you. Other thing we need to <clears throat> we need to chat about as well is the partnership with Waggle. Uh, yeah. And going through that, so um, second swing is partnering with Waggle. We have Waggle in our stores now, also available online. Uh, for those who don't know what Waggle is, uh, they're a very fun, kind of unique clothing brand. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, originally from Minnesota, if 
some cool hats, cool shirts, um, and now potentially a women's line coming. Yep. So um, uh, I guess how did that even start with with you partnering with them? Um, where did that start? And, and uh, I mean, what do you think about Waggle? Waggle's fun. Yeah, it's super fun. It's actually kind of funny. We got in contact through the 24-hour golf challenge that you guys are putting on. Yeah. And Waggle was sponsoring that event. And so we got in contact through that, and they were like, you know, we're looking for someone that's, they're, they're just a very fun golf brand. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the people that they have in, for their ambassadors, right, like currently or until I came on, were like hockey players or people that like, you know, played golf, but like were just really fun with it. And, um, and so they wanted someone that was also like a little bit more seriously yeah, a golfer. Yeah. And so, and then also because they are expanding their women's line. So traditionally, like right now they have men's hats and like that's probably one of their best sellers. Um, they do have some women's shirts, but like I would say they've mainly prioritized the men's side. And starting next year, that's that will um, change. They're actually going to be adding on a bunch to the women's line. And so I've actually been helping like design that and, and been partnering with them and like that's really cool. coming up with yeah. products that would not only be cool for the average woman golfer at a club, but also a collegiate level mm-hmm. player who, you know, is looking for certain things in, in their apparel. And so it's it's been really fun because I love fashion and I love golf. And so it's been really fun to partner with them. And they're just like a really great company. Like they understand, you know, they understand like what golf does for the game. And it's like fun for a lot of people and they want to, they want to bring people like right. more joy through that. So it's, it's been a lot of fun partnering with them. And also just like NIL in general has been such a really cool space for yeah. for people to, um, for athletes to, to take advantage yeah. of and like, and grow their brand. And um, I think it's been like a really cool to see how that's progressed over the past couple of years. And um, it's been really cool with me, for me with Waggle and, and obviously you guys and just being able to like, not only, um, build your brand but just like get a lot of experience as well yeah, yeah. in like future work or future jobs or what you want to do and um th- i almost think of them as like many internships in a way i think it's a lot of really good experience and people like any i encourage any athlete to take advantage of that space for sure if if, if you have the ability yeah i mean i think it's, i mean it's been awesome for just even just to like learn from you as as a as a player and you know the attention to detail you have but also like i was just thinking of like because Waggle is such a cool brand because, like you mentioned, they can, you know, have you as an ambassador, a great fit, really good player, and you're, like, into the fashion thing. But then uh, the, the way that their brand portrays itself almost to me is, like, any type, anybody that goes onto a golf course can wear Waggle and look like they fit right in, right? I mean, exactly. it's, they, and it's very colorful kind of, um, I don't want to say out there designs, but they're yeah. a little bit bold, right, yeah. uh, for the most part. And so... Um, but it, that fits for maybe the more casual player if they like mm-hmm. to be a little more vibrant in their in their I guess wardrobe. You know, yeah. that's where Waggle steps right in. Well, and exactly, and I and I know golfers that are really elite <laughs> that yeah. wear Waggle, and those who are maybe just average, and they also wear Waggle. So you're right; it makes people feel like they fit right in. You don't have to like. Th- that's the thing I think a uh, stigma about golf is that you have to dress like super. Oh yeah, like, I, I like that. That's changing. Dressy, too a bit. Yeah. exactly. Like yeah. very dressy very prim and proper and that still is the case at certain places but i think that is changing a little bit in the sense of it's opening a lot more doors to people who just want to go out and play a casual nine holes or whatever and i think that makes it a lot more fun for people because they don't feel so rigid when they're playing golf like i have to do great you know so that's like fun i think waggle definitely embraces that Mm -hmm. and that's really cool to see as well yeah i mean selfishly i like that hoodies are being brought exactly, back into golf yeah. as an acceptable. I like to wear hoodies out there on the golf course. Yeah. So, uh, other thing to discuss here, and we kind of have don't have a ton of time, but we'll wrap up with sort of, I know you like, we, we had actually a YouTube video on this um, that you guys can go back and watch if you'd like, but kind of growing the game, especially on, you know, the the young girls side, getting, uh, and it's actually, it is growing. I and mean, we, we had an MGA event last night at our um, a ladies night at our Minnetonka store. And you're talking to some of the uh, leaders in the Minnesota Golf Association. They were saying, you know, the segment of women's golf is the fastest growing one right now. So uh, clearly there's something out there working. But I guess from from your perspective, what would you maybe say to maybe there's parents out there that are watching or listening to this that might have children. You know, they're trying to, to you know, figure out what activities or what things they might 
and I want to push them towards. And I guess, what would you say about golf as an option? Yeah, I mean, for the parents out there, you are one of the, if not like the most influential person in your kid's life. And so if you're going to the golf course and you love it, there's a good or a decent chance that your kid will follow in, that, in those footsteps. I think in order to make it more fun, making sure that they have friends their age that also play is like really key. And that was one of the things that was, I think, hard about growing um, young girls golf, it, like at least 10 years ago would, would have been like, you know, there's just such a small population of, right. of young girls that want to play golf. And so seeing that grow really helps and, and making sure that they're plugged into a golf camp with their with girls their age or mm -hmm. kids their age or people at their golf course or just friends that they met through a tournament just so that they can like enjoy it and not always be practicing by themselves because golf is an individual sport but it's really important to be in in like community with other people yeah. and other golfers to be encouraged in that and it makes it more fun as well so I think that's like the biggest piece of advice is just to get your kids plugged into something but also you know make it a fa make it fun make it a family event and um, just spend time and like make it a priority to go do that or just spend time as a family and that's like for sure going to pay off dividends because if they if your kids see you know, you guys having fun and you want to be out the golf course, most likely they're yeah. going to want to as well. Yeah. yeah, golf's awesome. You, I mean, there's, there's the life lessons thing. There's also the relationship thing. You meet so yeah. many people. You, uh, mm -hmm. you're, you know, the kids will meet other kids, build yep. friends from a young age. And so um, there's a lot of advantages to it. I can speak to it from my perspective too. You know, there was the, you know, the golf lessons at the local muni and it was, it wasn't nothing special, but you know, you got to meet different kids that wanted to play golf. And then they were my high school golf teammates, you know, and things like yep. that. So it's, um, we always want to grow the game, and that's, yeah. that's the, the best way to start doing it is just by getting the young kids involved, and there's all these programs out there to make that happen. Too. Oh, exactly, and I think golf is, like, one of the few sports that you can play forever, you yeah. know? Yeah, true. And, and I think, like, that's the other stigma to it as well is just, like, golf is a huge game for, like, older people, yeah. which it is because older people can play it, but also it's it's growing a lot mm -hmm. like in huge numbers uh, among those who are young especially since covid and so that's been really cool to see um that change and and to see when more people like you know your friends are doing it whatever it makes you more likely to so it's fun to see because it truly is a sport you can play forever the people you get to meet i mean it's mm -hmm. just like it's really is like the best game yeah i can i can assure you i mean i have i had friends in, in college and high school that they would like laugh at me like you play golf you're you know you weirdo <laughs> and then they get through school they get through college and now they're big golfers right, like it, yeah. it's a very common kind of transition you get done with your school what do i do in my free time i'm gonna go play golf so um yeah i mean that's uh you're right i mean all these programs it's a great way and then, like you said it's it's um it's something you can do your whole life and uh, you'll meet great people doing it it's going to be a blast so um bella i think that's how we'll wrap it up here um this has been a lot of fun um so thank you for stopping in and kind of giving your perspective on really, I mean, we covered a lot of things here, yeah. but um, hopefully the, the people listening, you know, they learned a few things about whether it's the, the experience of being a D1 golfer at balancing academics, mentally on the course, you talked about how you can power through and, and win tournaments. Um, a lot of good stuff here. So um, Bella, thank you again. This was awesome. And uh, there also will be more stuff on YouTube as well. So stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you again, Bella. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Super, super fun just to like talk about, you know, what what life is you oh, know, yeah. outside of golf as well. So that was been that's been really fun. Yeah, we'll continue to do. We'll do more of this for sure. <laughs> Perfect.